What does Jurassic Park and Jurassic World franchise get right and wrong? I mean, get wrong a hell of a lot. What What are some like really definitive things to you that are interesting that it gets wrong? And also, what are the things it, it, it gets pretty close to right? Um... I mean, I, d I just want to press with my answer because I always, I always get asked about this, understandably, and it's like, I, I get that it's a movie, but if someone's going to ask me what does it get wrong, I'm going to give them an answer. But I get people going, oh, you're just nitpicking. Oh, you know it's fiction. Oh, you know it's made up. Yeah, I do know, but someone asked the question, so here's the answer. <laughs> I should say that some of the things I've heard you describe, I feel like it's the responsibility of those folks to get it right. I, I think th there's, there's something. Um, I really deeply admire, there's a show called Chernobyl. Mm. It's like, they don't need to be that accurate, but they really, it's like the detail of the the kitchenware yeah. in a room. Like just to get the tiniest detail right, who's that for? I don't know who's that for, but that's for the, that's great art. That's yeah. for the, that's the spirit of the thing. And like that, if you, focus on getting those tiny details right there's some magical thing happens about the bigger story yeah if you don't care about the details it, the story gets corrupted so i, I just want to say that some of the things you describe like how many fingers uh, yeah yeah it's like that's important to get that right because if you do some magical stuff can really emerge and it, it could become a legendary film as opposed to just uh yeah i mean uh, that, summer that, hit. That, that's my take again i you know i've i've worked on documentaries where they're claiming that accuracy is absolutely critical and 100 percent important and they won't put anything on screen that i haven't told them to and yeah. then many of those things turn out not to be quite as true as advertised once you get round to it so i'm i'm aware that when even documentaries will take massive liberties you can't be too harsh on what is popular fiction um on the other hand i am also aware that it is by far by a ludicrous degree, the most popular bit of any kind of media that includes my work, as it were, or something that I'm actively engaged in and know about. And so whether or not it should have that influence or whether or not the filmmakers should have responsibility, it, it does. It does have that knock on. Um, so, I mean, it's simple as stuff as t can't see if you can't move. Yeah, it could. I don't know where that came from. As far as I can tell, Crichton just dreamed it up. In in the Lost World, his sequel book, he hints that there's a research paper that says it, and that's kind of where he got it from. Um, there's a second paleontologist character who's advising Dodson, the evil in-gen guy, and he says, oh, no, that's from such and such his research. And like, I try looking up, as far as I can tell, it doesn't exist and never did. Um, so I think it's just straight fiction. And it's like, it works for the it works for the book and it works for the movie, but it's, as far as I can tell, it's straight fiction and Crichton just made it up. If it's buried in some bit of literature, he's done better finding it than I have. And I've had a really good look and I know how to look. And I've never come across anyone who's found it either. Um, but it does. It just like warps the perception. You know, Velociraptor, Cheetah Speed, Pack Hunters, Super Intelligent, Giant Sized Animals, and... Okay, 1993, it's a bit more forgivable, but even then we were pretty confident they had feathers. Is any of that true? Wait, so... Uh, Probably not. <laughs> the, 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 the pack hunter aspect? Um, so that's something I've written quite a lot about. Um, the evidence for pack hunting in any dinosaur at all is almost non-existent. Um, it, it basically doesn't exist. And that's going exactly back to, again, that stuff we were talking about, bite marks and taphonomy and like the history of specimens and, and how you interpret so, so what kind of evidence would show like maybe bite marks from multiple sources so it's so it's really really tough so the the main one which was put forward is there's this famous um association in montana of deinonychus which is often confused with Velociraptor, including in the books and movie. Um, basically, a bigger version of this that's rather older from the um, early Cretaceous, and a thing called Tenontosaurus, which is kind of Iguanodontin, so Iguanodon with the spiky thumbs, basically otherwise a fairly run-of-the-mill herbivore. And there are two sites, I believe, for this, but there's one that's much more important where you have a Tenontosaurus carcass with deinonychus carcasses and so the interpretation of this is well this is a group that brought down the herbivore and of course the immediate kind of counter argument to that is well why do they all die there <laughs> like when you know when lions kill a wildebeest they eat it 
They don't all just die next to it. Yeah. Or even if they did kill it and start eating it, and then like if they got into a fight and killed each other, well, lions as a species are not going to hang around for very long if every time they kill something they get into a mortal fight and kill half the pride. Um, there's nothing obvious that killed them, um, but it's at least possible that this was something like a predator trap. So predator traps are really neat. So La Brea Tar Pits is a classic example. The idea is a herbivore stumbles into something like tar. You've got your deer or wildebeest or mammoth or whatever it is, waist deep in tar and going, mm, I'm dying, I'm dying, and making horrible noises. And, you know, Smelodon walks over and goes, great, and wades out after it and is now stuck. And then the next one, and the next one, and the next one, and the next one, and then lo and behold, you now have something like La Brea, where they've got like, the, the numbers are something absurd, like, I think they've got like three mammoths and one ground sloth, and then it's like a hundred direwolves and 40 smelodon, because it's just sucking the carnivores in. Wow. And you get these really distorted ratios. I don't think that's the case of the Deinonychus tenontosaurus stuff because there's ways that you can probably rule that out. But there are probably places like this where it's happened. Again, the other one is um, the toxin one, who's yeah, Cleveland Lloyd. So it's just coming up on your screen. That's another one uh, with loads of dinosaurs. That's Allosaurus. Um, but we've definitely seen it with. I think it. W I think this has come up with something like lions or wolves. Like they found loads of them dead. Or by a lake and it turned out or this pond and this pond had got some really sort of nasty algal bloom toxin in it and the interpretation was the same kind of thing is that like, a couple of deer were drinking this stuff's toxic and kills you within minutes keels over dies wolf smells dead meat comes over starts eating it has a drink keels over and dies and then it, so it's not getting you're just dying from the toxicity rather than being like physically sucked in and trapped but the same effect can happen and so you just end up with a pile of dead bodies so i'm pulling up some stuff here first of all shout out to perplexity super awesome uh there it'd be great if you fact check some of this stuff so fo fossil discoveries including parallel trackways and bone beds containing multiple tyrannosaurus suggest these large predators sometimes moved and possibly hunted in groups you as a person who wrote a book about the behavior of dinosaurs yep let me deconstruct that like almost instantly so it's because <laughs> it, it's really easy because this this is my, my book on dinosaur behavior this is just the kind of thing i'm talking about so the the tyrannosaur trackways of a group of tyrannosaurs is i think four or five tracks total so it's like two from one animal two from a second animal and one from a third animal that's not the end of the world that's somehow how trackways form like you know the rocks broken up they stood on mud and then they didn't whatever just to clarify trackways means footprints of multiple maybe steps yeah one of them has got a left and right and the other two don't it's it's very fragmentary but i i haven't that, that's not a problem with the interpretation the problem is this is interpreted as a group of them moving together well why because they're going in roughly the same direction okay and they're roughly equal sizes okay but like i've seen solitary animals moving in groups um a guy i know quite well in south africa i go to south africa regularly for my teaching actually um and he's one of the big guys at south african national parks and he gives me the skinny on all kinds of weird stuff and he's telling me a few years ago that one of his park rangers had observed leopards hunting together in a group. Now, leopards are basically not just solitary, they're like antisocial. <laughs> like they beat the hell out of each other if they come near each other. But I've also seen, you know, you, you get game trails are a thing, paths that single animals take. If a female is in heat, like males will track her down and follow her. So you'll get one set of footprints, and then a couple of hours later, a male will come past, and a couple of hours later, another male will come past. And now you've got three sets of footprints all traveling in the same direction on the same bit of path, but they live on their own, yeah. let alone hunting together, which is a massive step above this. And then the one I've talked about quite a bit in my book is spotted hyena, Krakuta Krakuta, which is the one, there's a whole bunch of hyenas, but this is the one everyone knows. They're the big laughing hyena. And can see plenty of Attenborough type documentaries of them, seven or eight of them, or even 10 or 12 of them going into a herd and ripping apart wildebeest or zebra or whatever it is. But actually, if you read the scientific literature, this is really rare. They mostly hunt on their own. Now, they do live in these social clans with 
hierarchies and complex social interactions. They are very social animals, mm -hmm. but they mostly hunt on their own. So even if you find loads of trackways of them moving together, or as again, there's one, if not two for tyrannosaurs, we've got multiple tyrannosaurs together, and that's been argued for pack hunting. At best, that argues they might have lived together, but it doesn't tell you whether or not they hunted together. So how can we make a decision on one way or the other? So, I, I mean, I, I tend to be ultra conservative in this context, and I think we should probably avoid saying things that we're not quite confident about. I, I don't want to ever go down the, we must have really definitive, 100% convincing evidence, because this is paleo, and we don't have that kind of data. But just as I talked about with things like the predator-prey size ratio stuff, there is data we can start to use on living species about what tends to trigger hunting in groups or living in groups and what data there might be from stuff like brain sizes or other trackways. Or again, we do have bite marks indicating prey size. If you start finding repeated attacks on big prey, from relatively small predators, that would be quite convincing. Um, as you said, maybe we had bite marks of multiple different sizes. Now that on its own, mm, it comes hard because obviously scavenging, um, you know, tyrannosaurs are an exception. Most dinosaurs, most carnivorous dinosaurs have pretty similarly shaped teeth. So how easy is it to tell an adult from a juvenile from an adult from a different species that's just a bit smaller. Probably pretty tricky. I mean, for me, I think the the kind of gold standard, which I don't think we're ever going to find, but you never know, like you could in theory get a trackway of something like a herbivore with a whole bunch of carnivore tracks coming by it. We do have a couple like this, but they don't have what I'd really want to see, which is if you trace the footprints of the individual carnivores, and if A's in early on A's footprint go on top of B's, but later on B's go on top of A's, they must have been there at the same time. Because there's no way they could have been even minutes or hours apart. So if you had that, then those two must be together, or at least within sight of each other, and one's not turning around and roaring or having a fight. If you can do that with seven or eight, all converging on one herbivore, and then everything goes manic, well, that's really pretty convincing. It is so fascinating and awesome, the, like the Sherlock Holmes aspect of paleontology, like figuring out, because you have very little signal. Yeah. And you have to figure out the puzzle of it from that. And like, that's it's such a brilliant, you're giving so many brilliant examples of like, yeah, if A steps on top of B and then B steps on top of A, that's a strong signal that they were walking together. I am a bit of a Sherlock Holmes fan and he references Cuvier. So Cuvier was this legendary French anatomist, uh, Baron Cuvier. Uh, he was the first guy to posit that things went extinct working on mammoths. And he said, well, there's nothing like this alive today, so extinction happens. Which before that, we didn't really know. And Holmes has a line about, just as Cuvier can restore an animal from the smallest bone, so I can restore the events from the smallest detail. Or I, I'm paraphrasing, but I'm not far off. Yeah, there's you, truth to that. You have used an analogy that Conan Doyle specifically used for Holmes going back to paleontology. I mean, it's obvious. It's clear. It's right there. Yeah. That, that, that's how on the nose you are with that one. So, okay. So basically you clarified and showed all the things in Jurassic. <laughs> got <laughs> yeah, right. we, we, yeah we, we got off topic before we even got onto Jurassic Park. Uh, and just Velociraptor, you said, the, the, you know, the, yeah, the size, the pack hunting, all of that. The pack hunting, just to round off on that, it's like, I don't know. Maybe. Um, there's actually been some more recent stuff on Deinonychus looking at things like isotopes in the teeth and feeding traces and some other stuff that's hinting that maybe there is more going on there, um, which is great. I'm, I'm not anti the idea that this exists, but you, you absolutely get this buildup of the idea that Velociraptor is a pack hunter comes from Deinonychus. And I think the evidence from Deinonychus is really weak in exactly the way that, okay, Lions are group hunters. We know they are. Does that mean that leopards are and tigers and puma? No. So why on earth do you think that just because, Velo even if Deinonychus is, that doesn't really tell you anything about Velociraptor? Um, group hunting has all kinds of more complicated dynamics going on it than just close relatives tend to do it. You can flip that around, you know, 
African hunting dog, wolves, um, things like bush dogs. There's various canids that all hunt in groups. But then you've got things like maned wolves, which are effectively solitary. Um, the hyenas, spotted hyena, are, yeah, these super social animals, but the brown hyena, the striped hyena, and the odd wolf are solitary. So you, you just can't do group versus solitary off close relatives or anything like that. I am very sure a ton of dinosaurs were aggregates, li lived in groups to some degree, and I'm very sure some of them were social, with complex lives and hierarchies and even pack hunting. Which ones? <laughs> I have very little idea, because I think the data is so sparse that we can't really say it with any confidence for anything, in my opinion. I think that can be got at. I think we need to start getting at it with the sort of stuff that I'm talking about, like get a better understanding of what drives sociality in lions versus tigers versus leopards. You know, relatively close relatives who overlap. Don't forget, in India, leopards and tigers overlap with lions. The Asiatic lion is still there. Um, so you can talk about ecosystem structure and prey size and prey type and all this stuff. We can maybe, maybe we can start piecing that together a bit better and then apply that to stuff like the trackways and the isotopes and all the rest of it, um, bite marks and these mass mortality sites. So I think it can be done, but personally, like what were pack hunters? No idea. I don't think, I don't think any of them were in the sense that I don't think we've got good evidence for any of them. But there probably exists on earth definitive evidence one way or the yeah, other. Yeah, probably for some of them. I mean, it's, I think it's well within their scope. One of the papers writing about this, ironically arguing against pack hunting in Deinonychus, um, said that, well, it's probably not the case because you don't really see pack hunting in birds. And so if you don't see it in birds, then dinosaurs being their ancestor, well, if birds can't evolve it, then maybe dinosaurs couldn't have evolved it, which I'm not sure it's a great logical argument because of the complexities of social behavior anyway, but then there are a couple of birds which actively hunt in groups. Uh, things like the giant ground hornbills, um, Ethiopia and South Africa are a really great example of that. So, so that point is incorrect. And then we see, if not true sociality, we see cooperation in crocodilians and we're seeing degrees of social behavior in things like iguanas. So the idea that like, well, birds are super advanced and dinosaurs can't do it because the stupid reptiles are too stupid and therefore dinosaurs are more like them, which isn't quite what they're saying, but it's sort of the unwritten idea where we have social behavior and cooperation behavior in crocs and in lizards. So that really gives you the impression that dinosaurs theoretically at least are perfectly capable of that.